So I am delighted to welcome back uh, to DTU, Professor Hans Runix. Um, we we were having a chat before uh, uh, we came up here about Hans's uh, previous visit to uh, DTU, which was in February. Ah, you around <laughs> Apologies, yeah. So, so this lecture theatre is a little bit hard to find. So uh, thank, thank you for uh, all for, for making your way here. Um, so yeah, I was, I was saying Hans uh, was the keynote speaker at our first climate change conference in February 2019. And so we're delighted to welcome you back to uh, the DCU. Hans is here for uh, a One Health uh, conference uh, in Dublin uh, tomorrow. So we're we're very lucky to be able to uh, welcome you to DCU this afternoon. Um, Hans is Professor of Environmental Governance at the University of Antwerp, a Senior Research Fellow at the National University of Singapore, and former Executive Director of the European Environment Agency from 2013 to 2023. And under uh, Hans's leadership, the European Environment Agency transformed its extensive knowledge base into a more policy-oriented format ensuring its accessibility and relevance to societal and policy debates. Uh, he's now returned to, to the land of academia, having, having spent his career up to uh, uh, 2013 in, in, in academia. Um, so Hans, you're very welcome back to DCU. Thank you for joining us, Alejandro. Thanks. Thanks, good afternoon. Thanks for having me back. Um, it was a great pleasure being here last time. Uh, at, at what was then the start, I think, of also what you are doing now with the center and uh, the master's program. So it's great to, to, to listen and, and hear what is going on and how it is growing. And uh, so voila, I hope my lecture will be sort of in the spot on when it comes to the stuff that keeps you busy. Um, I would like to frame it around the European Green Deal. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and also focus on the systemic approach that is part and parcel, if not the core of the European Green Deal, and how that is under pressure now, because it is under pressure. Right? Um, I will go quickly, because you're all experts, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here, so the basic stuff is known, and then we can maybe have time for a discussion on, on where we are. I know that the camera, because people are also following online, hi. Um, I will not be able to stand still here. So if I disappear, I'm not really gone. Uh, so bear, bear with me. Okay. So I, I would like to start from the big challenges that we are facing, which you all know. You know this type of graph. Uh, it's uh, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Uh, this is the climate change challenge that we have. Uh, but there is also this challenge, which is the biodiversity challenge, where the grayer uh, it gets, or the more yellow, the more pressure on biodiversity ecosystems that are declining. Uh, and the last 10 years, I would say, there is a lot of interest in the connection between these two. And we will need strong ecosystems to deal with climate change, but climate change is in and of itself a serious pressure on ecosystems. So how you deal with that? Well, one of the problems is that in, in the public debate that uh, this is a really important issue and this is poorly understood. Yeah? And there is a tie that you can buy. You may have seen it with this graph. I Googled it. There is no tie on biodiversity. <laughs> yeah. uh, although, although the two are tied, I don't know for a non-native speaker whether that is an appropriate joke in English. But I mean, that, that is where we stand, yeah? Um, if you look at the key challenge, I, I often start my talks with this slide because you need to start from a science to policy base if you want to think in policy terms. And there are sort of a couple of places where they bring this knowledge together. IPCC, I don't need to talk about that. That's what you are doing here. IPBES, uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystems and Their Services. Uh, less known, uh, was in the picture a lot uh, earlier this year and last year with uh, the Kunming Montreal uh, COP on biodiversity. Yeah, 
much less known is the International Resource Panel. It's sort of the third panel of the uh, UNEP envelope. It looks at how we use our resources from mining them uh, to processing them and then in the whole circle and what the impact is on, on society and on environment and climate. I'm a member of the IRP and next year we come out with our four annual report uh, that goes to UNEA. But I think equally important is the World Health Organization and UNDP work, which is increasingly linking human health and well-being to the state of the planet. Yeah? And if you look at these panels, they all send the same message. We're dealing with a situation of urgency. Uh, they speak about the pivotal decade in which we are. You wouldn't always say that when you look at the policy responses, but that is what science is telling us. We are looking at irreversibilities in earth systems, which is why debates of loss and damage are becoming really important. Uh, we just recently had a breakthrough in the loss and damage discussions ahead of the COP. Uh, tipping points, uh, which I will say something more about in earth systems, but I think we underestimate the tipping points in social systems as well. And especially the fact that we're actually dealing about social ecological systems and their interactions, and these things are all interconnected. That's the message from science. Yeah, It's been there for a while. It's increasingly crystallized and clear. They speak in a louder and louder voice. And what is interesting, the cross-referencing in all of these panels and their reports is increasing. There is now an informal meeting several times a year of the key people in these panels to make sure that messages are aligned. And that's important. Yeah? Okay, what is the global response to that? You all know this, it's the SDGs. I added there again, because we've had SDGs before. Those of you who are old enough or fans of the history of sustainability know the Rio uh, summit from 1992, where we actually had SDGs. It was called Agenda 21, an agenda for the 21st century. If you update the language, you add the newest science, you actually have the same text, yeah? The same priorities only updated, yeah? Uh, we're less sustainable now than we were in 92. So the real question is, what are we going to do fundamentally differently in the next 30 years, which apparently we haven't done in the previous 30 years, yeah? And you cannot say that there was no political commitment in 92 because Everybody and their dog was talking about Rio. Uh, we had local agenda 21, we had national agenda 21. All, all these initiatives were there. And yet uh, we ended up uh, where we are today. Yeah? Um, it goes back even further. I will not dwell too long on it, but I went back to the text coming out of the Stockholm meeting in 72, the first global conference on the human environment. Yeah. And it mentions well-being. We now think that people like Kate Rayworth have invented well-being economics. I mean, I, I have, I'm a great admirer of the work that she is doing. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, of course, it's about well-being. Yeah. That's, that's central urgency, 1972. Yeah. Urgent. Yeah. Uh, we, need, we need the capacity of the earth to be restored. We think the nature restoration law fell from the sky in the last three years. This is 1972. Yeah, a life of dignity. This is an ethical choice. It's a normative thing. Life in dignity. It's, it's about human rights. Ignorance and indifference. You know, all of irreversible harm, irreversibilities, 1972. Yeah, so it, it was there, yeah. And of course, you know some of the history with Rachel Carson, limits to growth. And in 1973, the EU had its first year of the environment. This is in the square uh, Schumann, center of Brussels in the European institutions. And I like to show that because as a previous director of the European Environment Agency, this was also our logo. So we were the only agency in the EU system that has a logo on the square Schumann, yeah, which is... Uh, very nice. Yeah. Now, when we look at this history, 
through the lens of institutionalization, you can see that from the 1970s onwards, we've had really strong institutionalization of environmental employment and sustainability issues in national policies, where in those days the US was ahead, national air uh, law, uh, national Clean air act, uh, they were ahead. This continues. International policies of the 80s, a lot on pollution. Uh, we also have the origins of the uh, ozone layer convention there. Sustainability issues. Then you've got the climate focus that was really dominant for a while and crowding out some of the other topics. The sustainable development goals that is trying to link things together. And now we talk about the triple planetary crisis. Right? That's a UN language now to bring all of this together. Now, over the same period of time, if you go to the monitoring of the state of the planet, this is the evolution. Yeah. Okay. I, as a scientist, this begs for a research question. How is that? How on earth is that on earth? Is that possible? Right. We've institutionalized, by the way, not only in the public policy sphere, also in the private sector sphere, these endless round tables and you know organizations of businesses that are doing the green stuff. Yeah. We see that in science, we see it everywhere. We've institutionalized it. So why is that the case? Now, if you're a bad statistician, you say, well, these institutions seem to be bad for the environment. Let's get rid of them. Yeah, <laughs> But, but uh, you can use that as an example to show the difference between correlation and causality, of course. But OK, that's a joke. But, but then, if that's not the case, why is that the case? Yeah. Well, some people have been looking at that. And uh, there's a, a, a small but really stubborn community that looks at the counterfactual. Yeah? Some academic colleagues have spent their whole career on the counterfactual, pretty much saying it would have been worse without all of these institutions. Yeah? And that is true, but it's not necessarily what motivates me to get out of bed in the morning and, and to put my best effort into this stuff. Yeah? So others are looking at implementation gaps. There's quite a bit of that. If we would have done what we promised in many cases with hardcore legislation, we would be much better off. Also in the EU, waste legislation is a, is a great example of poorly implemented legislation. There are other legislations, yeah, but, but overall, it's not explaining this, this decline. Better regulation, yeah, there is, there is a more ideological, better regulation agenda right, with new institutionalism and rational government approaches. But in general, how do you make better regulation? Oren Young, one of the godfathers in the field of global environmental politics, uh, links that to institutional design, where he talks about scale, fit, and interplay. Huh? Those are the, the three dimensions that you need to look at to build good regulation and good uh, institutional responses. And then some say there's a time lag effect. Yeah? And the most vocal proponents of that are the people working on the environmental Kuznets curve. Yeah? There's a cycle in it. You first need to become wealthier and you pollute more and then you start to, to, to bring the pollution down. Yeah? This is uh, true for heavy industrial pollution, but not for the topics that we are dealing with today in terms of sustainability. Yeah? So. I don't think any of these explain it. I think increasingly we have to understand that these institutional responses did not address the core issue. And that is the deeply unsustainable nature of our systems of production and consumption. Yeah. And I know in the UN language, they like to speak about or, or sustainable consumption and production. There is method to the madness. Uh, if you put consumption first, producers use that to put the blame on individual consumers. I call it systems of production and consumption because I think that reflects the power relationships. And as a political scientist, we think in terms of power also in these systems. Yeah. So this is the European response to this context. Yeah, and that arrow should not be there, but that's fine. 
it is there anyway. Yeah. Um, I think the the whole idea of the European Green Deal, in essence, was to come with a real paradigm shift in the political commitment, but also the policy agenda to these issues. And it is by far the most integrated, ambitious, systemic, forward-looking, science-based agenda in this field that the EU has put on the table. Yeah. Um, to compare it to the previous Commission agenda, uh, Juncker, uh, who was the, the then Commission president, in his policy agenda, uh, the word environment was, was barely mentioned. He didn't mention the environment. I shouldn't lie to scientists. He mentioned business environment, yeah? <laughs> but, but not, not other environment. So this is really a new agenda. And it has a number of interconnected uh, dimensions to it. And the first climate neutral continent, a biodiversity strategy that in the terminology of the Green Deal said it will be world leading. Yeah? A new circular economy action plan zero pollution if you're a politician and you frame an agenda as zero I think that is pretty bold uh, I, I'm not sure I would have done that but zero pollution agenda a farm to fork strategy which is the first time that the EU is looking at a food system approach and not a narrow agricultural approach yeah which I think is really a, it's important to do that and it is linking that to health which is why I'm here tomorrow, the One Health approach that is making these connections. Then Just Transition, this is revolutionary. It's the first time that the EU is explicitly linking social distributional and justice issues to a climate and environment agenda. Those have been largely dealt with in completely different parts of the EU system, which is also the case at national level. Then the link with the uh, financial sector in sustainable finance and the link with industry. And to illustrate you the language that is used, because this agenda is translated in annual work plans or work programs for the commission. And it talks about tackling these things truly collectively, which is very difficult today because we're all under pressure and people tend to focus more on themselves than on collaboration when they're under pressure, which yeah, is not helping at the moment. But then Europe should continue to accelerate the radical transformation. Yeah. I can tell you this is not language that was used in EU documents five or 10 years ago. Accelerating a radical transformation. Uh -huh. uh, and it cannot be done with business as usual. Yeah. Okay, so these are strong statements that hint towards a more systemic and transitional uh, approach. Yeah. It also means that in essence, we are in the sphere of rethinking and reconfiguring energy, food, mobility, built environment and industrial systems. Whereas in the past, we have not been focusing on rethinking and reconfiguring them, there were two dominant approaches to the policy agenda. One was pollute-less, and the other one was optimization of systems that we already had. Now, system optimization, if you speak to economists, they will tell you they are increasingly more costly, and marginal gains become increasingly more costly, and engineers will say they are increasingly more difficult. Yeah? And by the way, they're tangential. So at the end of the day, they don't even meet. Right? And that's that's uh, the meaning of tangents. In, in, uh, so, so it's really about rethinking and reconfiguring. Yeah? But, and here's where the context for pushback comes in. Yeah? We are now in, an, in a space where, let me go back, when, when the first mentioning of the European Green Deal was at the end of 2019. You have European elections, there's a new commission, they come with a program, 2019. Then early 2020, you know what happened in February and March, COVID. Yeah, uh, yeah not so easy. Huh? And then a bit later, uh, I mean, big pressure on public finance. Yeah? 
Then we have the war in Ukraine, another hit uh, when it comes to context uh, that is important. And, and we, we try to capture that a bit in this term, the VUCA world, volatile. I think if you look at not just the last couple of years, but the last two decades, we've had a financial crisis and other uh, events, yeah, volatile, uncertain. Uh, which you see in a lot of spaces, yeah, complex. Yeah. We need to understand that uh, a globalized society has a number of complexities that are probably more important than we sometimes understand. And ambiguity, and I will illustrate that, I'll come back do that, yeah. And if you, if this is a difficult macro context, and that's of course what it looks like with inflation. Yeah? I, I have a lunch meeting with uh, with the ministers of environment and uh, health and agriculture here in preparation for tomorrow. They mentioned this macroeconomic context that is putting pressure on budget discussions and all. You know? well, we, you know where where we are in this world huh? so uh difficult yeah but to make it a bit more concrete in the sphere that we work in it's also a, a time period when uh the oil majors have made unprecedented profits yeah the five biggest ones more than 200 billion dollars yeah what? complexity of this whole situation ambiguity to add ambiguity, they make in one year $200 billion profit after everything else. And since 2009, the global community has been trying to get $100 billion per year together in a climate fund. And we're failing, yeah, which is becoming increasingly an impediment in global climate discussions. I would say it's an embarrassing and, and to be fair to the EU, the EU is not the player that is not putting in the money in the fund. It's others, but uh, this, is, this is part of the context. We managed to wean ourselves from Russian gas, which, I mean, if you think in one year's time, what the EU has done towards Russia in terms of the energy supply, pretty amazing. I mean, really quick, but we're now getting... Qatar involved and other places where the ambiguity of involving them and thinking of human rights and, uh, and you know, is, is, is this then in the future? And then you get from, from an, an, I would say, non-suspicious source, the World Economic Forum, I mean non-suspicious when it comes to environmental agendas, they're not exactly a, a green club, yeah? Um, <laughs> We could save one trillion in fossil fuel costs a year, but we're not doing it. Complexity, ambiguity, what is what is at play here? So in this context, we're trying to implement a big agenda. Another part of the context is this. In the last couple of years, we've seen phenomena in Europe that we haven't seen before to that extent. The summers have been really bizarre eh? with heat waves and rivers that become unnavigable. Is that an English word? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, I thought I invented it, but it exists already. That's good. Yeah. Forest fires, droughts. Yeah. This this is by the way not uh, this is not Chad. This is France. Yeah. Okay. So. You still have politicians, to my big amazement, who say this is an exceptional and unexpected summer. But of course, that is not the case because you've seen these pictures before. Ten years ago, we showed them like this. Um, exactly the same, only these were, this is scientific work. Yeah. So we showed these pictures before. And when we showed them then, we were negative. Yeah. We were pessimistic and we were trying to be alarmist and all of that. Well, maybe not. If there is one thing that natural scientists and especially system scientists are amazed about, it's about how fast certain things are changing. It's faster than what they thought. Yeah. Um, 
but it's also global, exactly the same phenomena and heat waves. Luckily, in China, you can go for the black dip in uh, the full. Yeah, this is the Yangtze uh, River. Yeah, it looks like the Rhine River. Yeah, uh, this, of course, is Hawaii. Yeah, where we had unbelievable uh, droughts. And this is probably the largest uh, disaster that we attribute to a large extent to. Uh, climate change in Pakistan, the floods in Pakistan. By the way, that's always a discussion if you speak to broader audience. How do you know that this is climate change? Well, I don't know. There is a scientific discipline that is called attribution yeah, science, and it works just like we do public health. You assign probability to certain events, and it's called a scientific discipline. Yeah? And I touched something here, which I should not have touched. Uh, but you don't see it. That's fine. Okay, good. Um, no, I did something wrong here, Dermot. Yeah, I don't know what I did wrong, but okay, I'm back. I think I'm back. Yeah. Okay. So here we are. That's not that's not complex enough. So I'll add a layer of complexity. A bunch of scientists, uh, Ben Cashor and others, have introduced this. Uh, super wicked problems concept. You know, we have wicked prop, super wicked prop, and they add four characteristics to uh, issues. Time is running out, and yeah, that's what you read more and more. The the voice from natural scientists: time is running out. Our yeah. um, policies discount the future irrationally. What I'm showing here is a winter drought in France, the image of a winter drought. If I would have shown this picture seven years ago and I would have said this is a winter drought in France, you would have probably gently escorted me to a mental institution. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we are programmed to think very linearly about the future. Yeah? But that's not what... Uh, Complexity and system science is telling us how things are evolving. Tipping points are not about graduality. So we are we are almost programmed to think in that way. If we add a little bit every year, the consequences will be a little bit every year. But that takes out the the the, the sort of system science and complexity science that we have today. Those seeking to solve the problem are also causing it, yeah? And that's where they meet every year in Davos. Huh? Um, no, no, but I mean, it's a serious point because who meets in Davos? It's the top of the governance system, the top of the energy system, the top of the food system, the top of the material system, the top of the mobility system, and the top of the financial system. They all meet. And they all wear the 17 SDGs on their vest. And if they're from the private sector, they at least have a vice president for sustainability. If you go to their website, you think you're on Greenpeace's website. Because no, I mean, that's the imaging. And yet, it's not happening. Yeah. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development, one of these institutionalizations, they've been claiming to be on the side of sustainability for the longest time. It, but, okay, those who are the most cynical and in my opinion, wrong, say, well, we, I mean, with these people and these companies, it, it will not work. Well, we will have to work with them because if you want the infrastructure of a renewable energy system, it's not going to come bottom up. You will need big players who can do big investments and have access to big technology and to big finance to do it, yeah? I didn't say that I don't believe in bottom-up initiatives and I did not say that, I'll come back to that, but we will need them, yeah? We we are going to meet again in Abu Dhabi or, or in Dubai of all places at the end of this month to talk about climate, I will be there because I represent the International Resource Panel's work there. It's not exactly in the place where I will walk around and think, ah, sustainability, what a, you know, it's fantastic. Uh, but, but, but 
I mean, for the moment, there is no alternative to the COP. If you want a political discussion at global level, there are alternatives at local level, but not at, so we, we sort of need that. Right? But at the same time, the weakness there is that there is no central authority. Right? And that distinguishes the EU where in principle policies are binding and we have a compliance mechanism and, and people are held accountable if needed in front of the European Court of Justice. Et voilà, huh? In the UN, it's, yeah, in theory binding, but it is what it is. Huh? Good. So we're dealing with this context. And, and then the scope of these transitions is that they need a deep character. It's not on the surface. It needs to go deep. There are no silver bullets, and that's difficult because still people believe in if we would do this, we would probably be solving, if not all, but most of uh, the issues. Huh? Think of the energy system now. These small modular reactors are now high on the shelf. Uh, the nuclear reactors uh, where people think, okay, but I mean, this, this could be the solution. I mean, at least in my country, that is the case. Um, so, but it's it's not how it works. You know, we're also locked in. Breaking out of these lock-ins in social behavior is difficult. Uh, think of the the just opening a discussion about food, how difficult that is. Yeah? Uh, and, and that can become a barrier to fundamental change. And so that's difficult by definition. Yeah? In essence, it boils down to these two, yeah. Uh, Planetary boundaries, well-being, and and here I, I mentioned Kate Rayward. He's in my slides, so again, nothing against Kate's work, huh? uh, but but that's that's where we what we are dealing with. Huh? Okay, now we see pushback. Yeah, we see pushback quite a lot lately against this agenda, and my my. Uh, hypothesis or my, my reasoning is that a lot of what we will talk about briefly has an internal logic, but it has no external validity. Yeah? A lot of the pushback has its own logic. And if you, if you say to these people, there is no logic in what you're saying, you have no chance of entering into a discussion. But you also need to be clear that their logic is not necessarily commensurate with the agenda that we're trying to deal with in terms of triple planetary crisis well-being. Yeah? So back to sustainability as a luxury pro uh, product. That's sort of reasoning that you hear in quite a number of member states in Europe now. This is not the time. Yeah? It's Macron, the pause button. Yeah? Slowing down, the pause button. Not now. Yeah? Climate, yes. But really, do we need to talk about biodiversity now? Do we really need a nature restoration law now? At this moment, let's slow down. That's that's part of the reasoning. It's sometimes protectionist. It also serves narrow interests, which have seen a space to occupy. Brussels is a city with 25,000 to 30,000 lobbyists. Yeah, They see spaces when they see them, and they try to occupy them. Yeah, The next elections, clear. Uh, do you want to come with a type of policy that is really difficult to sell to your audience? And will it get you re-elected? Yeah, there is, a, there is a clear logic in that. Any political scientist will tell you that that is the first thing that a politician is preoccupied with, because if you're not elected, you don't have power and you don't, you're not part of your, you know, the implementation of your agenda. So, yeah. Arguments without base or misusing global dynamics. The first couple of months after uh, the war in Ukraine, you had a really big push from the agricultural community to say, look, no additional pressure on agriculture because Europe might be facing a food crisis you know, because we get quite a bit of our... Uh, Food and and what is it called the the, the products that we use on the land to grow. Yes, so fertilizers. Yes, sorry, the word was not there. Um, so, no, no, there was no food crisis in Europe. 
there's a food crisis maybe in the Horn of Africa and maybe in other parts of the world, but don't misuse what you see somewhere else to put pressure on a European food system type of approach. Yeah. Then there is a populist card, um, which is playing strongly in Europe, in quite a number of countries. And there is a fairly recent study done on the link between populism and environment and climate agendas. Uh, they look at long-term time series where they look at regimes that uh, in governments that qualify as populist. And then they look at their policies and there is a clear link. Uh, I said populists, not right-wing populists, because whether they are right-wing or left-wing or non-directional populists, uh, as I tend to call them, it doesn't really matter because they start from the assumption that there are silver bullets, that there are simple uh, people to blame or institutions to blame. And that, I mean, so it's pretty across the board. And we see more right-wing populism than left-wing, but I would say the, the, the jury is out whether there's a lot of difference between them. Yeah. Then more, more clever by some is cost-benefit analysis, but without looking at the benefits. So let's do a cost-benefit analysis of part of this Green Deal agenda. And they calculate the cost, which is tangible. The benefits are often calculated in different ways. And by the way, they are not part of our traditional economic equilibrium modeling. So you, they're actually coming to the conclusion that there are few benefits based on a model that inherently does not include those benefits because natural capital and its long-term value is not part of that economic modeling. So of course you're going to find that. Yeah? And also the cost of inaction is often not taken into account. So this is a tricky one and it's more difficult to, to uh, discuss with. Yeah. Then also what I call, I thought let's throw in some difficult words and they think I'm an academic, yeah. the idiocy of myopic analyses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In Belgium, we have this saying in Flemish, it's komkommertijd, cucumber time, during the summer when there is no news, no real news. You know, the politicians are on holiday and there's not much happening. They bring all sorts of stuff into the news because they need to fill up the half hour. You know? um, and the most flabbergasting news last summer, I almost fell off my chair, was a research project that ran in Europe where some economists had calculated that uh, in Belgium, that was the Belgium version, uh, um, by 2050, tourism would go up by 8% because of climate change. Yeah. yeah. And that was based on a, on a three and a half degree scenario. Uh, so I, I said, can you rewind to radio news? No, you can't. And so I, I listened again. I said, you, you've got to be kidding me. So. Some, some economist based on a simple equilibrium model that has no connection to the natural world is calculating 8%. So I responded and I, I said, if we go to a three degree world, the number of people who visit the Grand Place in Brussels will be the least of our concerns. Yeah? <laughs> could, could, we, could we please shy away from this type of completely ridiculous, unnecessary and pseudo academic type of nonsense because it's not contributing to the debate. And lo and behold, for two days, this was in the newspapers and on the news in the evening, we have this political talk show in the evening. And th there was a minister actually responding and saying, well, it's about time that we start seeing the benefits of climate change. I mean, I mean, Get out of here, yeah? By the way, we should never fund stuff like that. Anyway, okay. There is also pushing back because we, we fail to recognize the inherent failures of the current economic model. I think I've hinted at that. It does not take these things into account. In fact, we call it externalities. There is a reason why we call it externalities, yeah? And fake knowledge, which we deal with uh, 
so also often eh? there is a close link with the populist part of course they all have their internal logic yeah but it doesn't hold when you think of biodiversity laws and you know, it, it, there's so but this is the context in which we operate now no? if the epp the european people's party christian democrats in the european parliament biggest faction the party group also of mrs von der leyen the president of the commission they work with this and they work with the slowing down and their interests and they think of the next elections yeah? if you think of uh, uh, the anti-european nutballs that are in the parliament yeah, they they work more with the populist part and with the knowledge and so they all use parts of uh, this agenda if they are against and there we have then the european agenda the climate law i will be brief on that this is the basic line of policy results now we go to net zero which means we don't have residual emissions the battle over that 10 percent is fierce because every sector thinks they have a disproportionate claim on that sector yeah uh, and we will need strong nature and technology to be built up to compensate for what is left that's the agenda yeah this agenda means that we will need to speed up by a factor of three our annual emission reductions compared to the trajectory from 1990 to now that's quite amazing we won't get there with optimization policies so this is a call for more systemic approaches and it's not only on well this is a nice example of why optimization doesn't work these are the emissions of the transport sector yeah and this is 25 years of efficiency gains and fighting pollution in european policy it's called euro one euro two euro three euro four euro five euro six euro seven that's what it's called yeah uh and and you see no decoupling here yeah so this is not the solution yeah of, of course not and by the way the electric car is also not the solution of a systemic mobility problem it's part of a of of part it's it's a partial solution to part of the problem yeah but you all know that yeah? we would also need to speed up the reduction of final energy consumption by a factor four and uh, increasing renewables by a factor two and a half yeah we're the closest here by the way yeah? that's the good news uh so this is the context yeah fit for 55 is the policy bundle that we need to deliver that according to the EU institutions it goes into a lot of spaces where again there's well organized pushback think of aviation the maritime sector traditionally sectors that have been left off the book so there's a lot of pushback there yeah um when we talk about the nature agenda biodiversity strategy We've just had a really intense month on the nature restoration law, yeah, where a lot of countries have pushed back uh, and a lot of groups have pushed back. And so we now have an agreement. It's, it's not yet the law, but there is an agreement. Uh, and, and we will need it for all sorts of reasons, yeah, from disease outbreaks to the fight against climate change. But, but this is why we need nature restoration remember my graph in net zero where we would compensate with stronger nature the natural carbon cycle this is a nice example of we discount the future irrationally that was a line that went nicely and gradually down but this is the reality of the measures uptake from uh, the natural systems it goes in the opposite direction yeah why because it re you need policies to make it go in the other direction. What is the name of these policies? Forest policies and nature restoration policies. If you don't have the policies, it's not because you draw a nice rational graph on a, on a map that it will happen. Yeah? And of course, the line was not just wrong. There is a whole modeling exercise behind it. But the modeling, in order for it to become reality, requires policy. Which policies? The ones that are embedded in the proposals of uh, the Commission, amongst others. The same with uh, the circular economy. Yeah? 
climate change is not an energy problem. Right? It's it, first of all, it's a societal problem more than than an energy problem, but it's also about products. Uh, and if you don't address that, we won't get there. And you will not get there by reduce, reuse, recycle, which we were taught as kids even, and that's how old it is. We will need to add repair, refurbish, and remanufacture. It was, by the way, European legislation on these things in the pipeline. There's a lot of pushback on that because it puts a lot of responsibility on producers and on systems to make this happen. Remanufacture, we don't have a system for that. So, uh, and refuse is becoming a more almost societal mechanism to deal with these issues. Uh, and I think we, we, we miss one R and that is to rethink. I could say a lot more about this, but I won't. But this is why it's necessary. From 2004 to about today, this is the incredible increase of circularity of the European economy. Yeah? I'm saying that with sarcasm, and it's gone down in the last two years. If we are really counting on reduction of our emissions through circularity, we're, it's too slow. Yeah, So we will need stronger policies on that. Zero pollution, again, an agenda that is until now not binding. It still needs to land in a lot of legislation. And it especially is connected to our health system, where the top 10 non-communicable diseases driven by environmental pollution, cancer, ischemic heart disease, pulmonary disease. I mean, you can walk here. Yeah, time? Yeah. Yeah, OK. The chemicals agenda. Strong pushback, REACH needs a revision. That's the European legislation on the registration and assessment of chemicals. Farm to fork, very, very, very difficult in Europe. Uh, we have not moved very strongly on that. Uh, and why is that necessary? Well, just the link with climate change uh, is there. You know that, so I don't need to dwell on that. A really important one is the social dimension. I don't think we have a good grasp on that. We don't have an, even have a good knowledge base on that. How much do you know in Ireland about the distributional impacts of environment and climate issues? I don't know, but I know many countries where there is very, very, very little information on that because two separate communities, the data are not linked. We need to do quite a bit more. Sustainable finance. Uh, we talked about a radical transition in Europe, not my language, Commission language. To what extent is the financial sector part of that? Um, we now have a taxonomy which describes what are green investments, but we still have a really, really, really long road to travel. Yeah? Uh, and that's where I prefer the American directness. Uh, they talk about capitalism. In Europe, we are soft-spoken. We say it's uh, the market economy, and I know there are differences between what they do and what, what most of us do here. But if you want radically different outcomes in a system called capitalism, it would be really weird to reach those without speaking about the role of capital. And this is not a Marxist statement. It's, it's, it's the essence of the system, where you invest, where that goes. Yeah. Oh my God, I did something wrong again. That's really bad. Okay, good. Industry, I will skip for now. What I think makes things very difficult is not this. This is the line of the optimistic line of uh, system transitions. You experiment with new stuff. You accelerate it through policy and financing and tax incentives. You institutionalize it. You cannot build a new house with... Uh, natural gas, it needs to be this or that or the other, and you hope to be in a better place. That's Everybody likes to talk about that. Yeah? What we don't talk about a lot is what we should be phasing out. And that's where the difficult stuff is. Fossil fuels. Yeah? You can still not mention fossil fuels and phasing out fossil fuels in the final text of a COP with climate. That's flabbergasting. Yeah, but it is the case. 
environmentally harmful subsidies. We've been talking about those for 25 years. How much has happened in Ireland in bringing those down? I don't know, but it's an interesting research question. Not a lot in many countries. Unsustainable tax systems. Yeah. Spatial planning that is unsustainable. In my country, that is a big deal. Uh, uh, spatial planning is sort of the brothel of local politics. Yeah. And it is the case in many countries. I once mentioned that in a conference in the parliament, the minister was not amused, but that's okay. Uh, we are not here to amuse ministers. So, you know, blatantly unsustainable consumption, which we, I mean, and, and unsustainable inequality. So these, the problem is not that renewables are not breaking through. The problem is that we're not phasing down uh, fossil fuels fast enough. Yeah? So we need this because Irregardless of the start of global climate diplomacy, greenhouse gas emissions keep going up. That's my red line going down. It really matters in terms of intergenerational uh, sustainability and justice. The tipping points, and I'll skip that. Tipping points are important. I, I know that I'm dwelling on too long. Climate justice is really critical on a global scale. If Europe wants to play its role in global diplomacy, this needs to be taken seriously. And you can say, yeah, yeah, but it's China, the US, and India. And, and then it's us. So why would we? No, because we, we have a role to play, especially in our connection to these countries, the least development. And so the, the whole idea is that is deep sustainability still possible, yes, but it's an increasingly steep and narrow path. By the way, this is a, a real picture, yeah? Mm -hmm. It's not where I would spend my Sunday afternoon, but uh, anyway. Uh, what do I mean with steep? It's all about speeding up and scaling up now. And narrow, we've wasted 30 years, so we're running out of options. And that is the language coming from these assessment panels. It's not my imagination, yeah? So now putting the pause button and slowing down the most forward-looking type of policy agenda on these issues is not a good idea. But we need to be optimists. Yeah? And why? Why? Well, let's look at the forms of optimism. Techno-optimism? Yeah, I'm a technology optimist, but it's not going to solve the problems. Yeah? If we will need technology. Naive niche optimism, the number of conferences where you go that a new startup has found a solution for something. Yes, but if you scale it up, what would be the impact? Is it scalable? So we shouldn't fall in the trap of naive niche optimism. There's EU bubble optimism. If you're really working in this green deal, you think, yeah, yeah this is all fantastic. But uh, I'm also doing stuff for National University of Singapore. We work with the ASEAN countries primarily. It's a very different discussion. Yeah, so we're we're not we're, Europe is not the rest of the world and the other way around. Although we're deeply connected, huh? bottom up optimism. Forget all these big things. It will come bottom up. Yes, yes, it will come bottom up. But it's not going to be enough. It's about connecting the dots. I think. Luckily, there's also evidence-based optimism. The International Energy Agency is monitoring rapid breakthrough of parts of a, a shift in the energy system in terms of mobility, e-mobility. And I did say that the car was not the solution, but e-mobility is breaking through faster than we thought. And in terms of materials innovation, we see a lot of innovation based on bio-based materials. I can see some of you thinking, yeah, but we don't have the biomass to do all of that. That's why we need a serious strategy of prioritizing biomass for sustainability objectives. But there are reasons for optimism. There's another reason. It's because optimists live longer. And uh, I say that based on a scientific article of last year, the American Geriatric Society looked at 22,000 people and optimists live longer. So that's a good reason for you to be an optimist. And uh, my final thing will be, is, is optimism really the issue? And I mean, I work for EU, 
Jean Monnet, who one of the founding fathers of the EU, when he was asked, Mr. Monet, are you an optimist or a pessimist? He said, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist, I'm determined. And I think uh, that's a little bit how I position myself in these debates, because I, I this is my, my working life is all of this. It's easy to get pessimistic. Uh, optimism is a moral duty. No, it's more a, a health duty, apparently. Uh, but I mean, determination will be... Uh, uh, a defining factor, I think, uh, if we want to do well in this context. So, well, I'll stop there. Sorry to be a bit verbose and lengthy, but I hope that it stimulated at least some of your thinking. Thanks.